Good morning. Um, I'm Margaret Bailey. I graduated from this university many moons ago, 1986. It was not the Collins College then, so that tells you I'm older than 50 years. Um, but I, uh, my degree was in, uh, at that point, the degree was offered in the business school. And so I grew up in this area, uh, moved away from this area and came back to the area and started on the board of advisors last September. But my career was in, uh, the majority of my career was in the outdoor hospitality industry. And we're gonna talk about what that industry involves. We're gonna talk about who's gonna be talking about this industry to you over the course of the next three months as guest speakers. We're gonna talk about careers in the outdoor hospitality industry. And um, that's my contact information. Um, I retired last year, but I am open to receiving emails and questions and no question is too foolish or too stupid. It's all okay. I'm a human, you are a human, we can communicate. It's all good, okay? Um, so basically over the next three months, I've arranged this lecture series and it's called the Richard N. Frank Lecture Series. And what I think it's important to know about Richard N. Frank is Richard N. Frank was the CEO of Lowry's Restaurant, which has nothing to do with the outdoors but has something to do with the fact that somebody was committed enough to this college to set up a speaker series fund. So people like me, not really me, because I'm paying my own way, but our guests can come and talk to you about industries. So that what I want you to understand is that the industry is committed to this university and this college and your future success. So this series is all about the outdoor hospitality industry. Today, we're gonna to talk about what is the industry and what are the career options in this industry. Next Thursday, we have Susan Liston with Aramark Destinations and da Daniel who graduated last year, who's been working in Bryce National Park, talking about the outdoor hospitality industry and opportunities for employment in national state parks with concessioners. Uh, then we have on October 12th, Mike Lutz, who is the executive chef at the Doho Cafe which is down, which is located on a California State Park beach. He'll talk about food and beverage operations and other opportunities with guest services. We have a field trip to an RV resort over in Boninelli Park, where you'll learn a little bit about the resort and camping industry and doing special events in the campground and resort industry. And then finally, on November 9th, we have uh, Todd Wynn Perry, who's a managing director with Horowath International, and he's going to be talking about how um, glamping and other outdoor hospitality uh, properties get developed, what's, what's going on in the industry and, and how do you think about the factors involved with development. So, and the basic, the idea is that each of these speaker series will be in this class and then they're gonna have a slightly different presentation during the U hour on that day, which we'll talk more about the company itself. So similar to the Castell event that you had on Tuesday, when, people arrive on this campus, the best time to make a informal impression is when they're here. So if, if I could encourage you to create your courage to ask questions and to introduce yourself, this is when people come to campus, give yourself bravery and take the time to meet, meet them because they'll always remember you. I mean, you can send them an email if you're comfortable with that. But if you go up and say, hey, I'm Bob or Susie or Juan or Teresa or whatever, just that's me as a former student basically saying, be brave because it will pay off. So anyways, let's start. So I call this my P plus P plus P V E equation. And in essence, the hospitality industry is really these three things. It's people experiencing a product in a place, and as a result of those three things, they have a guest experience or a visitor experience. And so whether it's people coming to a restaurant on the beach or a restaurant on the top of a hotel and, and it's located in an airport or in a center city or uh, people coming to a lodge located in a national park, the visitor experience that happens depends upon these three factors. And so we're gonna be talking today about how these factors in the, uh, are different in the outdoor hospitality industry. So 
Um, this chart is from the Outdoor Industry Association. And the Outdoor Industry Association gathers, every year does a survey of the American public and says, how often did you go outside? What did you do? And how often did you do it? And it, it's, and, and, and basically there's like 40 different outdoor recreation activities that are surveyed. And so the green line is the number of participants and the dark, I'm sorry, the light green bars are the number of participants and the green, dark green is the percentage. And so if you look at this chart, should we feel positive or negative about the outdoor recreation industry based upon that chart? Positive, and why Why do we want to feel positive about the outdoor recreation industry looking at that chart? It's going up. <laughs> if, if, if you were somebody who had a bunch of money in your bank and you wanted to invest it in an industry, this would be a really kind of good place to be investing in an industry. Now, why do you think that number went up between 2019 and 2022? You can't answer again. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, COVID. Okay, and based upon your own personal experiences, what happened during COVID? Where did people go? Go ahead. They went out. They went out. Yeah, and a lot of people went out. Like you may have gone to a place where you're like, I wish not this many people came out here because it's pretty crowded. So basically, COVID as terrible it was for people, many people personally, and the industry, some parts of the hospitality industry got really decimated. The outdoor recreation industry like exploded. And the good news about that is that in, in the industry, there's a term called stickiness, okay? You can't get a customer if they never experience you, you know? But if you get a customer and they have a positive experience, their stickiness in getting them back is better. So basically COVID was the best thing about outdoor recreation. Now, if you're gonna go and uh, go on a hike or you're gonna go on a bike ride and you're done with it, you know where most people end up? They end up in a brewery eating a hamburger, okay? Or if you wanted to go to the beach uh, and there was a cafe on the beach during COVID, you know, and you're hungry, you're going to go there. So what happened was, is all these people were outside and they wanted to eat and they wanted to uh, stay overnight. And some of the uh, lodging options in the outdoor hospitality industry were outside, like camping or glamping or um, things like that. So what happened was, is that, uh, just to go back, just the biggest sectors and this, now you'll see why I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you'll learn all about glamping in this series. Glamping is camping, glamorous camping is glamping. And I appreciate you asking that question. As I said, no question is not useful. So just to basically understand, when we look back at those categories, 22% growth in camping, 22% growth in hiking, 22% growth in fishing, and 22% growth in, in, in bicycle riding. You could not buy a bike during COVID because the so many people wanted to buy a bike. You couldn't even like buy a used bike because everybody was out on their bikes. The number of boats that were sold during COVID, the number of RVs that were sold during COVID was like off the charts. Um, so these are just, things that are happening. And so when private equity or when investors are looking to say, where should I put my money? Would we say it's a good thing or a bad thing to be investing in the outdoor hospitality industry at this time? It would be a good thing. You have a question? Yeah. Do you think there'll be a decline yeah, no, that's, let's just go back to this. That's a very good question. So during the night, during 2020 through 2022, I was still working with my consulting firm and we were doing all sorts of analysis of tourism in general. And this gets back to the stickiness factor I talked about. 
So if you are paying attention to the tourism press right, de- right now, there is a boon in Americans going overseas because they couldn't do it during COVID. So the people who are going overseas are not going camping. So yes, I'm anticipating that's going to decline some. But remember I said stickiness? So nobody even thought of going camping or going to a national park or you know going to these places until they experienced it and had a good time. And so it, it's like in their brain to like think about potentially doing this again. So, and, and typically it's very, in, in the investment industry into lodging and outdoor hospitality and recreation, it's kind of like a, a la- sometimes it's a lagging indicator. Money comes following results. I was on the phone uh, on Tuesday with a private equity company who wants to put money into a firm that's making campground reservation software. And they would not have been working with a firm that went into camping reservation software five years ago because there just wasn't the growth in camping. So um, that is a legitimate question and there will be some decline in, in, in this stuff. So anyways, going back to this, okay. So, and this gets to this slide right here. I think in order to get your degree from Cal Poly, you may have to take an economics class, a general ed, if you're a business, or at least I had to take an economics class um, and I took macro and micro, but basically any sort of growth in industry requires supply and demand. And so what was happening as you look at kind of the industry is that during COVID, there was a lot of leisure time. So people had 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 so the so the demand was increasing because of leisure time. The nature of the United States and who are its citizens are is changing. So what the citizenry may have liked, you know, the population profile of the ethnic groups may have liked one sort of activity, but now it likes a different activity. So that's changing. Um, obviously, you have this whole cohort of people old like me who is 60 who now have disposable income and have time. So with this huge increase in old people coming into the into their leisure time, that's that's a whole new sector for the industry to pay attention to. So economic, demographic, and social factors affect the industry. And so one of the things you were asking, Matthew, you were asking about glamping, <laughs> that's called product innovation. So it used to be that when you went camping, you were either in an RV or you were in a tent. And then there was a bunch of people who got old and said, nah, I'm not sleeping on the ground and I don't want to buy an RV. And so glamping was discovered. And glamping is basically a beautiful tent with a nice comfy bed with a bathroom in the tent or like not have to go outside to the bathhouse and really cool like central lodge with music and coffee. So it's kind of like a resort in the middle of nowhere that's a little downscale from resort. But that came about because of those factors over on the left. People, your generation's like, I'm not going to go. Some people in your generation are like, I'm going to go have a wedding and I'm going to go have a wedding at a glamping resort. And all my people are going to be in these really cool tents because that's what I really want. So, I mean, that's something that happens too. And then I talked about capital. The amount of money in the equity markets that's going into outdoor hospitality is never is, is, is huge. So basically the industry has identified it. So that's what's going out on the demand side. So when demand increases, what happens on the supply side? Go ahead, back there. Right, say it again. It increases. Okay. And so what you're seeing here is that the number of properties that are involved in the outdoor hospitality industry, whether it's more boats, more RVs, more resorts, whatever we want to call them, has started to increase. Or in the case of public agencies, if you go to a national park and you go to a campground, you might not be able to park your, you may not have been able to park your RV in it, but now the public agencies are saying, oh, we need to like fix the RV site so that we can get more people in our places. So sometimes there's reinvestment in the condition of the assets. And then the other thing that's happening is amenities. So remember I said, if you went to a campground, a private sector campground in the past, you might find RV sites and you might find uh, tent sites, but now you're seeing glamping sites and you're seeing cabin sites. So the amenities are changing too. And then basically while the ownership doesn't change, 
the main thing I wanted to show you about the ownership is, and this is partly why I wanted to give this series presentation, is you can have your supply on public land, which is state parks, national parks, county parks, city parks, and you can have your supply on private land, okay? And a lot of this, I, I was not aware that there are resorts and all sorts of amenities, restaurants on public land. And our nation's public lands are pretty cool places. We'll get to that in a minute. So that's just kind of like a little bit about the why. So I put into your uh, canvas two questions on a Google form and we got great responses. So the first question was, just to kind of show you how you actually represent some of the data that we just saw, like what did you do on vacation? Um, and so obviously a lot of you walked or ran or swam or the next two things was climbing, boating. So is anybody who said climbing in this class? Okay, where did you climb? Like, like said, oh, I can't climb things. Okay, but, we're, but you can't just climb on a wall or you can climb on a wall, but did you climb on a wall or did you climb on a rock surface in the middle of a place? Uh, I went down uh, to a waterfall down here. Okay, so it was a public place? Yeah, you need like a reservation. Okay, yep. Okay. Um, anybody else who hunted? One of, oh, nobody hunted, I guess. Sorry, I put it there. Sorry. It's okay. Um, uh, who, oh, did, oh, that was just one person I interviewed. So who went boating, kayaking, or canoeing? Where did you go boating or kayaking? Where? You went to Alaska? Wow. Where did you go in Alaska? Hold on. Sorry, I gotta get you. Can you get, yeah. Um, at this glacier place. You went to Glacier National Park. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty darn cool. Did you boat? Did you do? Were you on a boat or did you kayak or canoe? Um, I kayaked. You kayaked. Okay, cool. Anybody else kayaked or boat during vacation? Okay, where did you do it, Daphne? Uh, I went to Big Bear. You went to Big Bear. Okay. Yeah. And what, what what were you doing? Uh, I just went on a boat. You went on a boat, like a tour. No, we had our own boat. We yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Anybody else went on a boat kayaking? How about you? I actually had paddleboard. In where? San Diego. San Diego? Mission Beach. Okay. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, and then a couple of you um shopped, which is understandable. Um and um, who went camping? Anybody go camping? Yeah, we're like, okay, let's okay. You first. Where'd you go camping? Joshua Tree. How about you? Where? Idlewild. Yep, yep. How about you back there? Okay. Anybody else went camping? How about you? Uh, Death Valley. Death Valley. There we go. There we go. Which is a great transition to this place. This slide. How many of you have been to national parks, national forests, state parks, state beach, county park, city park, coastal beaches, or Big Bear? Um, so, and why I was asking this question was to illustrate that you are in the outdoor hospitality industry if you're vacationing in those places, okay? And how important those public places are to us being able to do the stuff that we wanna do. So what is the outdoor hospitality industry? Our last speaker, which I probably should have had him as the first speaker, Todd Wynn Perry is the managing director of Horwath and he is focused on the outdoor hospitality industry. This is how he defines the outdoor hospitality industry. It's generally aimed at nature-based destinations such as national or state parks and mountain and beach areas and serves both the individual leisure and smaller group markets. Remember I said about brides wanting, uh, couples wanting to have a wedding at a glamping resort, that's kind of an example of a group a group market. Um, so he has taken the industry and kind of put it into market segments, okay? And his market segments are hybrid RV parks, which have camping, glamping, cabins, et cetera. And we're gonna go to one of those on a field trip. Outdoor motels and hotels. And so we're gonna have speakers for those things that are represented on national state parks. Airmark and guest services are gonna be here. 
glamping and Todd is a, a consultant who does a lot of development advising services for all the firms that are developing glamping. And then uh, our speaker, one of our speakers, Malia, is going to talk about some of the luxury experiential resorts. And so um, the, another way I thought about this, and Todd's talked about this, is that when you go to a hotel in a center city, or you choose a hotel in a center city, you want to go and do what's available to you in the center city. Well, when you go to a hotel or a lodge in an outdoor that's in the outdoor hospitality industry, the reason you're going there is because you want to spend more time out in nature than you do in the hotel, okay? So that's kind of the best way to think about it. So with that, do we, is she here? here yet? I'm here. Yes, she is, okay. I would like to introduce you to Malia Silverman. She is a 2017 grad from the Collins College. So only been out of school for like six years. Um, I have up here on the chart, her career path is evidenced by LinkedIn. Um, she'll talk you through that. Um, but I had to reschedule her this, uh, this actual presentation because Molly was a little busy last week. So Molly, you want to tell them what you were doing last week and take it away. Sure. Well, thank you all for having me. Nice to meet you all. Um, I, like Margaret just said, I graduated in 2017 from the Collins College. It completely shaped my entire career. Um, so I'm very grateful for it. But um, yes, last week, the past couple of weeks, she tried to schedule me a couple of times. And last week, I was actually traveling for work to Jackson Hole in Sun Valley. I got back last night. Um, so we were checking out some of our properties with exclusive resorts, what the company that I work for now, which I'll go into later. Um, I was a little busy. We were whitewater rafting and biking and <laughs> getting to experience what our members experience there. And then the couple weeks before that, I was actually out traveling for leisure and was down in uh, your neck of the woods. I was down at Mount Whitney, summiting Mount Whitney on Labor Day weekend and did a seven day backpacking trip in Mount Rainier the following week. So as you can tell, I'm a big lover of the outdoors. I spend every weekend exploring our public lands. Um, I live in Washington state right now, up in Northern Washington state outside of North Cascades National Park. So I'm a big consumer and user of the public lands. So um, I'll jump right into my career path and kind of how I got started in the outdoor hospitality industry. Um, it started at Collins College. I did an interview with Tanaya Lodge during one of the um, the job fairs in the spring, and I got a summer internship as an activities intern, and that was such a blast. I grew up, um, just to give you a little quick background, I grew up in Montana, which everyone thought, you know, oh, you must be so outdoorsy. I was not. Um, I grew up camping about once a year, and that was it. But the summer internship in Yosemite really just changed my whole outlook on my career. And it uh, gave me the opportunity to see what outdoor hospitality was. I helped with um, guiding archery, with guiding uh, hiking and kids camps and doing pool maintenance. Um, so it was a really eye-opening experience. We did field trips to Sequoia and Kings National Park. We went into Yosemite every day off. So it was really uh, just a very special experience and that led me to wanting to work in the outdoor industry or get to work somewhere that was special to me in the outdoors. So when I was looking at applying for jobs, I um, applied to a couple of different jobs and I turned down some actually pretty great job opportunities because I they just worked in the outdoors that I was looking for. And I leveraged my network my um, connections at the Collins College, and I ended up getting a job at Montage Deer Valley as a rooms manager in training. Um, during that position, I rotated through valet, front desk, uh, concierge, and I really clicked with concierge. And the reason that this happened is because as a concierge in Park City, Utah, you get to experience the local skiing, the local fly fishing, the whitewater rafting. You do all of this so that you can connect with the guests and share with them through personal experience what sort of outdoor adventures at these resorts they can come to experience. These members or these guests are paying a lot of money to come experience the outdoors. So it's like elevated, super, super elevated glamping, I'll say. It's at a five-star, five-diamond luxury resort 
members are paying a lot of money to come here and experience the outdoors at the highest level of service. So that really made me fall in love even more with working in the outdoors and working kind of in that outdoor adjacent. And from there, I wanted to um, grow the outdoor side even more, which is when I heard about the Student Conservation Association, which is a um, unpaid internship. And I didn't think that two years out of college, I would take an unpaid internship in the middle of Alaska, but it was a great opportunity to get involved in the park service. And um, working at Wrangell San, San Elias National Park was just a completely life-changing experience. It was truly one of the best experiences of my life. And again, didn't think I would say that about an unpaid internship. It was in the dead center of the largest national park in the entire United States and backed up to Kluani National Park in Canada, which combined was the largest, it is the largest wilderness area in the entire world. So as you can imagine, there was a lot to explore there. There was just plenty of um, plenty of things to do, plenty of things to see. And I got to go um, flight seeing, I got to go rafting, I got to go ice climbing, backpacking on a glacier. It was just incredible. And from there, I was like, this is what I want to do. I need to be in the parks. I need to be on public land. I need to be working with these people who are wanting to come do these things. So as soon as my internship finished, I had about a six months off because the outdoor industry, a lot of, you'll see a lot of seasonal positions. So a lot of those roles that are kind of rotating through, um, mostly in the summers, as that's kind of the high season for the Northern hemisphere. Um, so during my off season, I actually got to travel to um, Israel and Europe. I spent six months in Israel and I actually interviewed for a position with the park service at Glen Canyon while I was overseas. So that was pretty incredible. And I ended up getting a position working for Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, but unfortunately that was during COVID. And as Margaret was just saying, during COVID, um, the outdoor industry really blew up, but unfortunately the park service was cutting down on staffing. So literally the day I left home and started driving towards Utah, they canceled my job. And so I was without a job, hung out in Utah for a couple of weeks and started applying to jobs and found a position as a ranch ambassador for Vermejo Park Ranch. So that kind of goes into the private uh, land ownership that you can work for. And the working on Vermejo Park Ranch, it's a 500,000 acre dude ranch that's privately owned by Ted Turner. There are um, some of the highest peaks in New Mexico are on that ranch and the only way to access them are if you live or work or pay to visit that ranch. So it was a very, very unique experience. I got to um, arrange activities for the guests coming on site from hunting, shooting, um, fly fishing, horseback riding, anything you can imagine for a dude ranch. I was helping the guests to arrange that. And I was getting the experience of a lifetime to live there and arrange all of that because again, because it's private land, you didn't have access to that unless you were working for them or paying to visit. So when I finished that, that was a seasonal position I was hired for. Um, I wanted to come back and go to the park service. So I ended up getting rehired um, for Glen Canyon National Recreation Area and working directly for the park service this time. Uh, when I worked there, I worked as a fee, we call it a fees ranger. And so I was at the booths at the um, the park entrances where cars come in and pay for their entry. You get maps. That was really incredible. Um, again, getting my favorite part of it is getting to share personal experiences and saying, hey, this weekend, I just went down and did this amazing hike. If you're looking for a full day hike, go check this out. You know, recommending them places on Lake Powell to go visit, different things like that. So the park service was a blast. It was um, very fun and rewarding to get to wear the, the famous park ranger hat and uniform. And ultimately, after about nine months, I decided that it was time to leave. And that was more of a personal decision because uh, my partner ended up getting a job in Washington State. And so I was looking at moving and hoping to continue with the park service. But the, um, the job opportunities were just a bit limited where I ended up having to move. 
or choosing to move, not having to, but choosing to move. And um, I am right outside of North Cascades National Park right now, but it would be about an hour and a half commute. And I wasn't willing to do that. So ultimately I was applying for um, two different career paths. This is the time that I'm like, this is when I want to shape my career. So I was in the middle of applying to the law enforcement program with the Washington State Parks to go down that route. And then I also was applying to the position that I'm currently in at Exclusive Resorts. And I ended up getting both job offers and being <laughs> tied completely down the middle. Um, and I decided to go with Exclusive Resorts rather than stay with the Outdoor Hospitality um, Law Enforcement Program. I thought that that would be really incredible, but something was just holding me back saying, I don't know if I am totally cut out to be a law enforcement ranger at this time, but I think at some point, um, I was telling the last class, I think I would love to go back to the park service or work with a vendor that operates within the national parks or public lands, because there's just something so special about working with and guiding the people who come visit our public, public spaces and public lands. So that leads me to today where I work as an account manager with exclusive resorts. I work with 80 different membership bases. And I will say that this industry and this job that I'm currently in is outdoor adjacent, we'll say, um, because we do work with a lot of different vendors and private um, travel operators, such as Dude Ranches. Um, we work with different uh, creators of curated experiences. And so I love talking with my members about them going to experience our resorts within our portfolio, like Montage Deer Valley, and hearing about what they did on site and hearing them say, we did this incredible hike. And, you know, sometimes because I live there, I even give them recommendations or getting to talk to them about the different opportunities for travel within our portfolio and the, um, again, the experiences they can have while they're doing that. So it's kind of a quick overview. Um, I can say a lot about the outdoor hospitality industry, but one thing I want to touch on really quick before we jump into questions is that in my short uh, six years out of college, you see a lot of different movement in my career and a lot of different companies. And I will say that that is more typical than you'd think. Um, coming from Collins College, a lot of people go down the direct career path and it is very, very successful for them staying with one company for that whole time. Um, outdoor hospitality can be that way, but I'd say more often than not, it's a lot different. You grow by being willing to move locations and move jobs. And so getting those different experiences in the hospitality industry, like I said, a lot of the outdoor positions are seasonal. You rotate every summer. A lot of people, when I was just rafting this weekend, the raft guide told me that every season she works as a raft guide in the summer. She goes to travel for a few months and then she comes back as a um, ski operator for the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. So it really changes a lot. Um, if you are interested in the outdoor hospitality industry, be open to that, be flexible with that. Some of the best experiences I've ever had are because I've taken these random jobs that I had no idea what it would lead me to and just moving around and being flexible. So. That's what I have for you today, and I'm open to any questions that you all might have. Okay, I've got the, I, I would never guess that you would have a question. Yeah. Okay, you got a few. Well, we're gonna give you a chance to ask one, and then we'll come back in case someone else has another one. There you go. Okay, so, hi, Malia. Uh, my question is, if you wanted to get more involved in the outdoor hospitality industry while in college, in our shoes, what campus clubs or volunteer work would you suggest to get involved in? That's a great question. Um, like I said at the beginning, leverage your career fair. Um, take those internships. I know that like, well, I'm not sure if they still come. I'm sure they do. But like San Diego Zoo, they are a big hirer. And I think that that's um, somewhat outdoor adjacent or outdoor industry. I've got friends who worked for the San Diego Zoo while they were in college. Tenaya Lodge is always hiring. Um, Student Conservation Association is absolutely amazing. They are fantastic for summer internships, as well as um, AmeriCorps. I would say getting involved in different internships like that. And then in terms of clubs, I know that the club program has shifted a lot, but I will say that any um, 
tours that I could be involved in while on site and just getting out to see what's out there. And it sounds like you might have some glamping tours coming up or something um, where you're going to experience some of the public lands around you. I would just say take advantage of any opportunity you can to get to see different things. Go check out your public lands. Go look into the tour operators. Um, almost every single national park site page has a list of vendors that operate within their national park. So look at those, see if any of those stand out to you and just see, yeah, I guess that's the best advice is just see what those companies are and start looking into that. And Miley, that's part of their assignment for this class today. We've oh, got good. 40 different companies to look at. So we'll, Perfect. that's that's awesome. Other questions? Hold on. Come on, guys. This this we love this. We love this guy. Let's let's diversify. Hi, <laughs> I just wanted to ask. I saw you have I'm looking at your LinkedIn too. You've had like multiple jobs. So would you say that working in the outdoor hospitality industry is more different than working like the regular hospitality industry? And how would you diversify the two and what what would you say are like the pros of working in outdoor hospitality versus working in like the regular field? I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. good question. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, biggest pro for me, <laughs> you don't have to wear a suit every day, typically. <laughs> that <in> mind. <laughs> um, no, honestly, it's, I think the outdoor hospitality industry, people are coming to have a relaxed, uh, adventurous experience. It's, not um, coming from having worked in both five star, five diamond luxury ski resort from going to the National Park Service. It's very complete opposites in terms of how you interact with people. Um, you know, working at five diamond resort, you're trained on how to say things on what you can and can't say. You always say yes. The park services, you know, somebody comes into my booth and says, hey, can I go drive into the onto the beach with my little Chevy Malibu? And I say, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, I can say no to people. So it's um, it's just very different in terms of how you interact. I'd say that people coming into the outdoor hospitality industry are looking for that more relaxed, uh, those more relaxed interactions. They're looking to build a relationship with somebody who is out doing these things as well. They want to ask you questions. What did you do this week? And what do you like to do around here? So it's more um, talking about your personal experiences and sharing those experiences with somebody rather than the luxury sector is more uh, focused on providing members or guests information on what they might be interested in, not necessarily what you might be interested in. So I don't know if that answers your question, but those are some of the the first things that come to mind. Okay, I'll, I'll come back. Hi, so I see your LinkedIn, you moved around a decent amount. Um, would you say uh, having to move around uh, just different areas of the country or just different uh, companies is necessary for the hospitality industry or would you, do you believe you would still be successful if you stayed in one place? I think it could go either way. And I know that um, a lot of my friends from Collins College have lived in the same city since graduating college and have been extremely successful in what they do. And so I don't want to say that you won't be successful doing that. Um, it's proven that you will. But I think that in outdoor hospitality, um, you do become a bit more successful from moving around in my experience and from what I've seen with coworkers who have moved around. I think that there are more opportunities and particularly in outdoor hospitality, they're looking for you to come with a diverse background of experiences so that you can um, bring in a bunch of different knowledge and ideas from, you know, from your dude ranch experience, from your travel experience, from working in national parks whatever it may be. I think that that has honestly leveraged my resume. Um, some people might disagree. I'm not sure, but I think that moving around a lot has helped me a lot personally and professionally. We have another question. Malik. Hi. Um, what do you think is the biggest issue with the outdoor hospitality industry? The biggest issue. 
I don't know that I see an issue with the outdoor hospitality industry. I guess maybe the biggest issue that I have is that not all operators outside of public areas, outside of public land are um, focused on being stewards of the land. And that's really important to me is making sure that we are protecting and preserving our natural spaces for future generations. I sound like a park service employee right now. Um, That's very, very important to me. And I think I have seen um, that some tour operators or uh, concessionaires or lodges or things like that, that's not their main focus. And I think that that's something that we could look to improve with future um, future outdoor hospitality uh, students who are coming into this industry. Okay, I, I, I'm making it a couple more. <laughs> uh, what do you think sets aside the outdoor hospitality industry from like the rest of the hospitality industry? Um, something that we talked about just a couple hours ago in the last class was that you really, in order to be successful in the outdoor hospitality industry, you really have to care about the outdoors. And it's, Margaret said this earlier, you can't fake liking the outdoors. You can't fake being an outdoors person. And so I'd say that that's kind of what sets it apart is that in order to go into outdoor hospitality, you need to care about the outdoors. You need to care about um, getting out to see these things, because if you're working in, um, you know, for the national park or something, and somebody comes in and asks you, what should I do around here? What have you done recently? And you, your answer to all of those questions is, oh, well, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. I, you know, I, I'm not a rafter, I'm not a hiker, then they're going to be like, well, why do you work for the park service? (laughs) So, you know, they, I think that's really what sets it apart is you need to be somebody who cares and somebody who's interested in it to be successful in it. Hi, it's me again. (laughs) Um, Was there a person who said something to you throughout your career that stays with you today? What did they say and how did it help you get to where you are today? Oh my gosh, that's tough. I don't think I have a specific example, but I will give a ton of credit to the Collins College faculty and staff. They are absolutely incredible. And I think when I was graduating and looking at jobs and saying, oh my gosh, that's not what I want to do. You know, I was hired for a position in, I think it was like Ohio or something. And I'm like, I don't know, like, this isn't something that I'm interested in. What else do I do? They were willing to sit down and talk with me and, you know, explore my interests and say, well, what about this? What about this? Have you talked to this person? And so, um, yeah, not a specific example necessarily, but leverage your your great people standing in front of you because they are extremely, extremely helpful and knowledgeable and have some incredible connections within all industries. Molly, one of the things that I think relates to both these questions is you talked in the last class about knowing yourself. Do you want to talk a little bit about how knowing yourself and what drives you has affected your career? Sure. Um, Yeah, I think that, yeah, I guess I didn't touch on it as much, but coming from the internship in Yosemite, where I was spending every single weekend in the park and getting to explore and doing all day hikes, I moved back to LA to start back my junior year, honestly, a little sad. I was like, you know, this isn't what I just was experiencing. I don't want to leave Yosemite. This is like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, so when I got back to LA, I spent a lot of time in Joshua Tree. I know some of you said that you've been down there camping or hiking or climbing or whatever. I spent all the time in Joshua Tree going back to Yosemite, you know, going to visit some of the natural areas. I did Mount Baldy in the National Forest. And so um, I think that that just is when everything clicked for me is I'm supposed to be doing this. This is I'm supposed to be somewhere in the outdoor world. Um, And so when I was looking for jobs from the beginning of my career until where I am today, I was looking for jobs that could provide me a work-life balance where I could get to experience the things that were important to me. And so like, for example, when taking this job, it was a job that offered a lot of flexibility. I work remotely for my company. It's based in Denver. 
but I, I mean, this picture that's on your screen right now, that was because I had the flexibility in my current position to um, work from wherever I wanted. And I did a 10 week long mountaineering course in Washington where I was in the mountains every single weekend learning to climb uh, like alpine rock climbing, glacier travel, um, overnight camping on snow, different things like that. And so I think that as you're learning more about yourself, if you know, whether it's in the outdoors or not, if you're willing to move or willing to take careers in different places, make sure it's somewhere that you find something that is of, of interest to you, because that's really really what um, has made me successful is getting to um, enjoy and explore the areas that I've lived and have worked. Okay, my last question. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay, please. I love it. Um, do you have a favorite environment that you like to work in? You mean physical or like- Like physical environment like, because- it's, it's, That's different from where she's happiest because I think she's happiest at the top of a mountain. Is yeah, but you? like physical environment, like- or environment that you like to visit, like obviously going to the Alpines and being at Joshua Tree are two different things. So yeah, um, my favorite place I've ever, I mean, I always say I have two favorite states. My two favorite states are Alaska and Utah. If I could have houses in both states, I would. Um, I love, I'm, I think I'm a desert person at heart. So I love the Southwest. Um, yeah, I worked in Arizona, New Mexico, and um, Utah and my current company is based in Colorado. So I'd say the Four Corners is one of my favorite places in the world. And then Alaska, you just can't can't compare it to anything else. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. We got another question. Yep. This is also my last question. Um, <laughs> do you think that the job that you're currently in is the job that you're going to stay in for the rest of your career? No. <laughs> not because not because I don't love it. Um, I love what I do. I love working with members. This position is very heavy relationship um, based and I, I absolutely love it. I feel like a part of my members' families. One of my members the other day called me and she's like, well, thank you for being my travel therapist. You're amazing. So <laughs> um, that's my new job title is travel therapist. But with that being said, I... Um, I really see myself kind of going back and combining my my knowledge of luxury hospitality and my passion for the outdoors and working um, for, there are a lot of travel companies that curate outdoor travel experiences, um, thinking like All Roads North, Natural Habitats, Back Roads, different companies like that. Um, we actually, my company works with all of these companies. And so I think that getting to um, create and manage itineraries and experiences for guests and members of these, um, you know, bespoke luxury travel companies would be ideal because it'd be the perfect combination for me. And ideally somewhere that works with public lands and goes into these public spaces for um, getting to travel. So that's that's maybe the next step. A, a couple of years down the road, but I think that where I'm at right now is a great spot to be. And I have opportunities to grow in my career. And there are opportunities coming up to be um, like a travel manager for some of these curated experiences with experiences within my company. So I'm hanging out here for a while and learning as much as I can while I'm here. Cool. Any other last questions? Malia, thank you so much. And I will make sure that all these presentations um, will include Malia's email and her LinkedIn profile so you can connect with her. They're all going to be posted on a, a, a site we'll give you some information on. And uh, just thank you so much. Uh, I do remember talking to Malia on the phone about careers in the national parks. Um, and that's an example of a professor telling Malia to go reach out to this person who's doing that. And so her yes. advice of using the network here is is super important. And um, that's why I'm here to help you. And that's why she took two hours of her time to be here to tell you that stuff. So when people say reach out, they're not, they're not just saying reach out for reach out, they're being sincere. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time with us today. Yes, thank you all. Thank you. Please reach out anytime. Okay, so.
We're going to go on to um, the assignment. Can we move the? Uh, okay, so um, you had a survey that I wanted you to fill out, which I appreciate. And then this is part of the assignment. Um, so I am big into one of the things that Malia talked about was the seasonality of these positions. So I know school just started, but believe it or not, most of the companies who work in the outdoor hospitality industry hire their people for the summer beginning in January. Not in April, not in March, not in May, in January. And some of the positions with the internships, like the SCA and, and, and other internships, literally are looking to get those internships filled in the next month. So I want, I, I'm a big proponent of understanding how to plan for and execute on job searches. So I know you're gonna be working on your resume in this class, but what I did here was I, these are 40 companies that are involved in the outdoor hospitality industry. And, and your homework was to kind of start looking at this. And what I've done for each of these is given you a link to the organization and then a link to their career page. I made it very, very simple. Now, one of the things I wanted to do in the way we set this up was set it up by kind of parts of the industry. A lot of times when you think about a job in the hospitality industry, you think, oh, I'm going to have to manage the restaurant. I'm going to have to manage the people. Or I'm going to have to manage the kitchen or I'm going to manage the special event. Those are all positions. Those are management positions. But there's other sectors in the industry that are kind of more self you know, not not dealing with as many other people, but dealing with, you know, just yourself. So so what I wanted to do is explain these different columns to you before you start into some of your in-class time. So the first column is employment with public agencies who have positions that you may not think are directly related to the hospitality industry, but they are. So Malia talked about interpretation. State parks put on special events. County parks put on special events. The, the person who greets you at the gate at um, Yosemite is their, their most important job is they like to deal with people, okay? So I've got National Park, State Parks, Corps of Engineers, California State Parks, County Parks, City Parks. And then I've got two things here. I've got the Student Conservation Association and I've got this, the USA Jobs. USA Jobs, is the federal site to be employed by a public agency. But one of the things Maya didn't talk about, but is true, is the Student Conservation Corps and, and is, is a pathway to get higher up on the hiring ladder than if you just apply from the outside. It's kind of like you need experience to get experience. And just, I'm gonna talk a little bit about internships and obviously the Collins College doesn't promote unpaid internships. They shouldn't promote unpaid internships. What happens with the SCA is typically what they do is they take care of your housing and they give you a food and a transportation stipend. And when you finish it, you get a stipend for the job, okay? So if you think about, you wanna go work up in Alaska, she didn't have to pay for her housing because they gave her her housing. And then she didn't have to take care of her food because they gave her a food stipend. Now she had to drive there. She probably got a transportation st uh, stipend. The other thing is most of these public agencies are really focusing on having employees who look like all of you, which is America, because they've kind of been behind the power curve in hiring people that represent America. So there's a whole bunch of internships that are focused on getting young adults who look like America into positions in these public agencies. Those are a lot of those internships that are literally people have to apply in the next month. So if you're interested in working for a public agency, you need to send me an email like soon so we can start looking at some of those internship opportunities, okay? The other issue is um, with the park service and the forest service, there are private, there are positions in those agencies where you and your hospitality degree specifically would be very important because there's positions in the concession program where there's people who oversee the private sector hospitality firms. And so there's all sorts of opportunities in these sectors that you don't think about. The next one, we're gonna have a speaker from Aramark and guest services, but those are the companies that are private companies operating on public land. And uh, Malia 
work with Tanaya Lodge, which is a Delaware North company. That's a private company that worked right outside of Yosemite. But Susan with Aramark represents the company who is operating all the lodging, food service, and tour services in Yosemite National Park, okay? Um, and guest services also has national and state parks. Vista Recreation manages a whole bunch of campgrounds and national forests. And U.S. Hotel Resorts happens to be a large concessioner who runs probably one of the largest, most amazing state park uh, lodges in South Dakota. And again, this is not the universe. This is just a sample. The next category is the outfitters and guides. And the reason I've got this up here is because you heard Malia talk about, you know, she recommends this bike tour or this hiking experience. Well, a lot of outfitters and guides and bike tour need people to manage their food service or actually take people out on the hikes or on the bike ride. And if somebody climbs or somebody bikes or somebody hikes and you're great with people, you could be a guide. And that's the hospitality industry. So that's why we've got that up there. Technology and consulting. Itinio, Tyler Tech, Booz Allen, Hamilton, and Aspira are companies that have software that manage campgrounds in national and state parks. So these are probably not first out of school jobs, but you could end up working with a state park agency whose software comes from Aspira and know how about camping and all of a sudden you're a valuable commodity. Um, access parks, outdoorsy and hip camp are basically, outdoorsy is the largest equivalent of Airbnb for RVs. So, you know, that's, that's a company. Uh, Access Parks is the company that's providing Wi-Fi in campgrounds. Hip Camp is, is, a, is a company based out of San Francisco that's providing a technology platform for, in essence, the Airbnb of camping. If someone has like an extra backyard that someone wants to pump a, pump a tent in. And then uh, these two firms, my, the one I used to work with and Horwath uh, Hospitality do consulting to the hospitality industry. These two companies don't typically take entry level people but um, because you need some experience before you start serving them. Uh, the, the second to last column is products. Just like Cisco is a company that recruits here and they represent products that go in hotels. These are companies that represent products that go into the outdoor hospitality industry. And then the last column, and Todd's gonna be talking a lot about the last column, is private companies who have outdoor resorts, camping or glamping facilities or lodges. Now most, so like a couple people talked about hanging out in Joshua Tree, Auto Camp opened their Joshua Tree property. Uh, it's right outside of uh, uh, Joshua uh, Tree um, just last summer, I guess. So anyways, these are all the sort of camps, uh, hotels or glamping resorts that are focused on having a presence and having outdoor accommodations adjacent to beautiful places. So uh, can you flip to the, oh, just go down. So the assignment was to look at the first page and begin to say, oh, I wonder what this, maybe I want to go work for the National Park Service. Or, you know, I'm really intrigued with like what Malia talked about in regards to like outfitters and guides, or, you know, I'm really interested in this technology stuff. So I wanted you to kind of look at the columns and then, you know, you could, it, there's no right answer here. It's more or less getting you to get your head into the outdoor hospitality industry and see what's out there. So it's very simple. By the end of the day, you turn the assignment into uh, Dr. Dr. Ben. I want you to put the name of the company you'd like to sit around the campfire with and then put a little bit about why you're interested in it. Um, again, there's no right answers. The objective here is to just to get moving and start seeing it. And, and the last thing I would say here before we open up for questions is, this presentation is intended to expose you to a sector of the industry that you may not have known about. The one regret I have in my career was every summer, I would have liked to go work a summer at a national park, and I did not. Now, in my career, I've now visited many of them. But if you don't know about something, you can't try it. So this is not to say the outdoor hospitality industry is better than, you know, the restaurant industry in a center city or anything like that. This is just to say, hey, if you happen to be the type of person who really likes the outdoors and you like hospitality, 
there's a bunch of stuff you can do and why not try it? Because in essence, you have four, three summers in between, between now and when you graduate, depending on where you are in, in, your, in your education here, and why not try it? Um, the one thing I would say, and Susan's gonna talk a lot about this, is that uh, first the, the, both the first and the second column, if you go work in a national park, or if you go work for a concession in a national park, typically your housing is taken care of and your food is taken care of. Now they charge you a small stipend, but my point is that's not an expense that you have to worry about. It's a very, it's a below market rate. So, and Daniel will talk about this next week, but it's a good way to sock away some money. <laughs> and then the other issue is if you're going to a national park or a state park, the people you're working with could be from all over the United States and the people you're gonna be serving could be from all over the world. So again, it's it's kind of like a ticket to a new place. And if you are the type of person who likes that, it's a really interesting way to do it. So, so again, this is, I'm on the board of advisors, so I'm here for that. And there's my email and I will get Malia's email as well and make sure it's posted on the end here. So you have that, I, that was an oversight on my part. So 